Welcome back to Occult Symbolism and Pop Culture. I'm your host, Isaac Wise. Up today, we're going to start a journey, a deeper dive into the Hoover Dam. Sounds nerdy and boring? It won't be. I assure you. And in part one, we're going to talk about what the Hoover Dam is, in case you didn't know. Uh, some of the ideas of the symbolism behind it. As evident in some pop culture examples I pulled up for you. We're going to talk about architecture. You know, the architecture, how this thing came up. We'll talk about the architect, Oscar Hansen, who's Illuminate Confirm AF. So stay tuned. We're going to hit it all. And then in part two, next week, we're going to go into the statues of Prometheus. That's right. Statues worshiping the intellect, the archetype of Prometheus, which, as you know, is a very Luciferian concept. Okay. And in part two, we're going to break down all of the occult doctrine, embed it into this thing, right? And there's a reason for that. This thing ain't going anywhere anytime soon. It's going to be here for thousands of years. When the, the aliens and the who knows what come from another planet, they're going to find that. That Hoover Dam, they're going to say, oh, these guys were Illuminate Confirm. Because that's what this is all about. So without further ado, let's get... Oh, and quick word. If you haven't subscribed, you better subscribe. Patreon.com slash Illuminati Watcher. I've also enabled the Apple Premium Podcast. I saw lots of you signing up. That's the easiest way to get in. Easiest thing on the planet. If you go to IlluminatiWatcher.com, hit the VIP tab, you can see the various platforms. You can get all the bonus episodes. Because every month I do a bonus episode, Right? In the summer, I'm going to, I'm going to forewarning, forewarning, this summer, starting right now to summer, I'm very busy. In fact, I'm probably going to do a whole show explaining what's been going on with me because you've noticed I've been very absent on social media, uh, but I got a lot going on right now between the dreaded day job and uh, all kinds of stuff, right? You don't want to hear the whole sad story. I'll save that for an entire podcast where you can hear me crying and pissing and moaning. But but I'm still going to be doing that bonus episode every month for all the supporters. So believe you me, you don't want to miss out on those because there might be a week or two here or there that the free feed losers are going to feel like real big losers, you know, because they might not get any episodes for a whole week. They're going to go without. And you don't want to do that. So you know where to go. You know what to do. Link in the show notes. Okay. The Hoover Dam. Let me start off. Let's get a little woo-woo about this, all right? A friend of mine actually started me down this rabbit hole, which I, you know, the Hoover Dam, that sounds boring as hell. Who cares, right? Well, some friends of mine, we were having, there we were. There we were, having dinner. I still remember like it was yesterday. It was actually a year ago, all right? That's how long it took me to complete this. Not that I was working on it this whole time, but you know what I'm saying. Uh, Because I was actually trying to research more and get a copy of this book by the architect that I couldn't get. Long story short, we'll come back to that here soon. There it was. The summer of 2022. Salt Lake City at the El Chihuahua with Josie and our friends, Misty and Matt. And uh, they brought up the idea about how they had just gone to the Hoover Dam, which I found very interesting. Because I... Uh, I don't like talking about this stuff because I'm a dork, all right? And we're talking about it, and they pull up a video. They said, hey, don't you do some kind of weird podcast? And I said, you know what I do? I do do a weird podcast. And they said, why don't you look into this Hoover Dam? Look at these statues. And they show me these pictures in this video they took of these statues. I said, wow, those really are strange. I'm going to look into it. And now what was strange about all this was just three weeks later, I'm not going to exaggerate it. Some people would say days later. I'm not going to lie to you. Three weeks exactly because I wrote it down. Three weeks later, I'm reading Nick Hinton's book, The Aquarian Singularity. All right. And I was taking notes from it. And I came across a passage about the Hoover Dam while I was reading through. And I thought, oh, that's odd. I just was talking to the friends and they were talking about the... uh, Talking about the thing. And I pulled out the notes here. 
Uh, this is from chapter nine. There was a couple interesting points. He says the Hoover Dam splits time because it sits in between two time zones. The first time it produced energy was on 9 11, 1935, which is exactly 66 years before 9 11. And I'm going to come back to that because I got more to add to that that uh, you're not going to believe. We're talking about Kabbalah, the Klepoth, the Fallen Angels would actually fit into that 66. And then Nick says, in Transformers, the Hoover Dam stores alien technology. And in the Edge of Tomorrow, it's the hiding place of the Omega, the alien trapping humanity in time loop. Now, and we're going to come back to those entertainment symbolisms. I'm coming back. Hold that thought. But I was like, oh, that's strange. I, I was just talking to my friends about this. How weird. Then I recalled the the request to research into Hoover Dam, and I thought, man, there's, there might be some synchronicity going on in here. I better get into this, right? And then, seconds later, I open up Twitter, and the tweet at the top of my, you know, they have like the uh, the trending crap for you uh the tweet at the very top was a video of the hoover dam exploding and i thought am i living in reality anymore i don't know so if you do if you look at the timeline july 19th 2022 is when the hoover dam exploded that same day i was reading nick hinton's book and three weeks prior I was uh, talking about it with some friends. Weird, right? I mean, not the weirdest thing on the planet, but weird. So then I thought, I really got to dig into this. So I took it serious. And, you know, and and by the way, if you're some Hoover Dam nerd and I get some of the factoids about the Hoover Dam wrong a little bit, calm down. I'm not an expert. Just some conspiracy dickhead. Right? So let's talk about what it is first, and then we're going to get weirder. Weirder and weirder, and then in part two, we're going to get the weirdest. So, the Hoover Dam, they call this thing the eighth wonder of the world, which, to be fair, they call a lot of things the eighth wonder of the world. But, hey, it's pretty big. It actually uh, it's said to provide power to six states, including Nevada, Arizona, and California. And it basically uses, uh, what do you call it, hydroelectric water because of the Colorado River turns some turbines and you know generates electricity it's how they generate like, like a generator in a car all right except instead of the belt turning it the water turns it and it's down there on the border of nevada and arizona uh this thing was again built in the 1930s dedicated formally by frank uh franklin roosevelt fdr is that his name franklin never i haven't thought about that it's fdr that's what i have in my notes you know who I'm talking about. And wasn't he the biggest conspiracy of all, to be honest? Let's look that up here real quick. Make sure I got that right. Wasn't he the biggest conspiracy of all time? People always say, why? They can never hide a conspiracy. Well, yeah, Homeboy was in a wheelchair, and they hid that from the public. So there's that. You know, I don't buy that whole, oh, there's they could never hide. They can't. The government's so incompetent, they can't cover up anything. They couldn't keep the truth out. Oh, they can, and they have. The Manhattan Project and FDR being in a, a wheelchair. They can do it, all right? They're not as these bumbling idiots. You know, and, I, and part of me thinks that that's what a lot of the people who are very anti-government who are always crying about, oh, they're losing all of our tax money on dumb stuff. They, they're they so inefficient. They don't know what they're doing. And I get that, right? There's that leaky bucket principle, and, and that's kind of how the government works, right? It's a big moving ship, and they lose money sometimes. Totally. I get it. I understand the libertarian argument. I, I, I totally get it. I'm not here waving the everything the government does is great banner. That's not the point of this. What I'm trying to say is, I think that there's a conspiracy to prop up libertarian thought that the government's just a bunch of clumsy morons. They could never pull anything off because then it then it takes away 
from the reality of the situation where, no, they can. The Manhattan Project, they get this thing quiet. They built entire cities to build the first atomic bomb. And don't get, and look, I'm just I'm just going on a soapbox rant, but I think the timing is in Germany, the scientists figured out nuclear fission in December of 1938, and about five years later, we were detonating atomic bombs, right? Five years. That's all it took. And they kept it quiet, and they built entire cities all over the country. To make this happen. You don't think they can keep a conspiracy quiet? Okay. Golf of talking. They kept the truth about that quiet for 30, 40 years. FDR in a wheelchair. Anyway. Where were we? Oh, yeah. The Hoover Dam. Provides water to Lake Mead, the largest reservoir in America. Originally, shouldn't I, you know what I should do is I should be a Hoover Dam, uh, what, what do you call the uh, tour guide? I should be a tour guide. And then I can go on these conspiracy rants, see how long before they fire me. I think that'd be fun. That's what I should do. I mean, you know what? I'm going to, that's it. I'm quitting the dreaded day job. We're doing that. Now, here's what's interesting. It was originally named the Hoover Dam after, obviously, President Herbert Hoover. But as you can see, it wasn't, it was dedicated by Roosevelt. Why not the Roosevelt Dam, right? Well, uh, Hoover was the president during its construction. It was his baby back in 1929 when he was the president, okay? And sure enough, when Roosevelt took office, he didn't want to name it after Hoover at all. He's like, no, we're calling it the Boulder Dam, all right? He was hating. He was hating. So, you know, everyone wants to say things are worse now than they used to be. They were always this way. You know, every, every every fragile male ego gets in the office and can't handle it. Not that I'm saying females are any better. I mean, females get emotional too. But I'm saying, like, there's divisiveness. It's always there. It's that competitive capitalist thing we do in America. Everything's a competition here. That's how, the, that's how we're born and raised. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. There's a lot of great things that come from capitalism and competi- competition. But yeah, he was hating, and he's like, no, we're calling it the Boulder Dam. But then in 1947, 12 years later, in 1947, of course, the most curious of years, we had the Roswell crash, and that's when a lot of the government ag- agencies started researching all of the alien stuff. Remember that? But now FDR, he was a Freemason, he was a Grand Master in the Order of Des Molay, right? Named after Jacques Des Molay. And this was like a youth organization for little Freemason occultists. Walt Disney was a member. And, and, and Des Molay, it's named after the Grand Master of the Knights Templar, Jacques Des Molay, who was burned at the stake infamously for heresy, for spitting on the cross, for worshiping the Baphomet, for doing uh, homo sexy time rituals. Because back then, uh, you weren't allowed to do that stuff. And they were doing it. They were going for it. They didn't care. Now the construction, one last thing, and then we're moving on to symbolism. The construction of the Hoover Dam was completed by a consortium called Six Companies. Right? Now you want to get crazy. We already talked about the 66 years after it first gave us electricity of 9-11 happening. Well, I mean, six companies. There's another six. 666, maybe. The perfected number of man, perhaps. I don't know. The idea of man using the intellect and wisdom and Luciferian knowledge to scientifically create a new world. Now let's talk about the symbolism. Let's move on. Uh, This is, uh, let's talk about some films. And the most ironic example is Transformers. From 2007, Michael Bay, Megan Fox, Shia LaBeouf. Lots of Illuminate Confirm going on there, right? And the irony is that on that fateful day in July 22, when the Hoover Dam exploded... 
guess what? It was an actual transformer that exploded. Which is alarming because in the live action film, and again, shout out Nick Hinton, in his book he tells us that the Hoover Dam stores alien technology. So let's go back in time. Let's take a look at this movie, right? I'm going to read you from Wiki because I haven't seen this movie in many years. I saw this in the theater in 2007. That was uh, Blue Pill Isaac. Just happy to be alive. Not worrying about researching movies or Illuminate Confirm this or that. I had watched David Icke's Freedom Road. I had read Bill Cooper's Behold a Pale Horse, but that was just funsy fun time. Back when Nickelback was rocking out, Lincoln Park might be playing on the credits. We don't know. I'm going to read you the plot from Wikipedia. The planet Cybertron was consumed by a civil war between the two Transformer factions. The Autobots, led by Optimus Prime, and the Decepticons, led by Megatron. For the AllSpark, a cube-like object that is the source of all Cybertronian life. Now, let's pause for a second because the cube is symbolic of Saturn. And in Freemasonry, the cube is the foundational element because it goes back to platonic solids. The square, when they say, in Freemasonry, they say, oh, you're not in your square. Because the worshipful masters actually stand on a cube. All right. The cube is representative of the material realm of Earth. So the Autobots want to find the AllSpark cube so they can use it to rebuild Cybertron and end the war. While the Decepticons want to use it to defeat the Autobots and conquer the universe. So it's a source of energy in the Transformers universe. Megatron found the AllSpark on Earth, but crash landed in the Arctic Circle and was frozen in the ice. Now let's talk about the parallels with The Thing. John Carpenter's The Thing. The UFO crashes there millions of years ago. Wrote about it in Aliens, UFOs, and they call it Your Delusion 2. Now available on Amazon Audible. I narrated it myself. Support your boy. Get the book. We talk about the whole... James, uh, John Carpenter, Apocalypse Trilogy. The Thing, Prince of Darkness, Mouth of Madness. You ever heard of him? Check it out. And uh, then and Bob Lazar, he talked about this. He talked about how he had seen that there was a, a UFO crash in the Arctic, Antarctica millions of years ago that all his Area 51 folks were looking at. Anyway. Captain Archibald Witwicky and his crew of explorers stumbled upon Megatron, you know, in the ice, in 1897. Captain Witwicky accidentally activates Megatron's navigational system, causing his eyeglasses to be imprinted with the coordinates of the All Sparks location. Sector 7, a secret United States government organization, discovers the All Spark in the Colorado River and builds the Hoover Dam around it to mask its energy emissions. So, a conspiracy... Let me finish reading. It says, The still-frozen Megatron is moved into this facility and is reverse-engineered to advance human technology, which is the story Bob Lazar says. That the UFO crash, they're trying to reverse-engineer it. He was working on the anti-gravity device. But they're saying the conspiracy in the Transformers universe is that the government builds the Hoover Dam around the AllSpark to mask the emissions because it's creating all this energy. They'll just say it's from the water, right? But it's not just the film that this Transformers storyline exists. If you dig into it, the older comics, the Decepticons were just trying to steal some good old-fashioned energy from the Hoover Dam. And Herbert Hoover wanted to secretly store the AllSpark there, and that's allegedly why they named it after him. All right? Obviously not true. When you dig into the film version of events, though, the 2007 Nickelback Lincoln Park film, we find that Sector 7 actually calls this Hoover Dam location Area 52, a.k.a. the Igloo, right? Referring to... The frozen Antarctica Megatron, the who was basically a UFO. So interesting that a Transformer actually exploded at the Hoover Dam in 2022. And there's a whole plot line about Transformers, 
Hoover Dam alien technology in the films. Now, Nick mentioned something about Edge of Tomorrow from what I, and I've seen this movie no less than five times. One of the greatest movies of all time, starring you know who, okay? And I believe the dam is actually in Germany that is referenced, okay? Uh, but I can't avoid a chance to talk about Tom Cruise, so let's do it, right? Uh, one, you know, and Edge of Tomorrow, one of the greatest films of all time, one of the greatest, top fifty easily, easily, uh, maybe top one hundred. We'll say, if you like Tom Cruise, if you like Groundhog's Day, this is your movie. Okay, if you haven't seen it, skip ahead about five minutes. One, well, maybe not even that long. Skip ahead. I'm going to spoil the plot right now, okay? Don't let me do it because it's a great movie. Because the film is about Tom Cruise. He's in the military, and he has to get on the front lines reluctantly to fight these aliens called Mimics. And the military, they're, you know, this is the future, right? They're wearing these mecha suits, ironically, like Transformers. They kind of look like Transformer anime. And Tom Cruise's character, he's in the military, but he's he's an officer. He's just a he's he's just a public relations guy. He he just goes on the news and stuff like that, you know, real soft guy. Intelligent. Intelligent. Uh but has zero experience in the front lines in the real military, they say, you know, the real military. They call they call that a pogue, right? Person other than grunt. That's what they call that. But the, you know, joke's on you guys because guess what? They're going to drop Tom Cruise, old white-collar Tom Cruise. They're, they're going to drop him in the front lines, and he's still going to save your ass, right? He's still going to win. You can't take him down. Even in the movies where he's a puss bag, he's still kicking ass. Come on. <laughs> Look, I know it's fiction, all right, folks? Don't. I began, I've been fielding a lot of... A lot of crybaby comments, and uh, you know that's why I'm I'm taking a break from social media. People can't handle it. So, <laughs> anyhow, somehow Tommy gets caught in this time loop. All right, gets caught in a time loop, and he won't die. So in a way, he's found the path to immortality. He's found, in a way, the uh, the elixir of life, as they say. Anyhow. He learns, he memorizes how each day is going to go so he can fight the alien mimics and uh, a la Groundhog's Day, Bill Murray. Another great movie, P.A. Shout out to P.A. And he basically figures out how to fight the final boss called the Omega. All right. And the Omega, and I believe this is what Nick had said in the book. Don't quote me. I believe he said the Omega is where is hiding at the Hoover Dam. Uh, I believe he's actually hiding in a dam in Germany. But then the real Omega is actually hiding at the Lou underground in Paris, right? The Lou, the inverted pyramid. Because that has the as above, so below symbolism at the Lou. The big pyramid above, and then there's a tiny pyramid below. Very crazy stuff. If you've read Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code, you already know. Because that's where they talk about that stuff. All right? Anyway, uh, I'm not going to spoil any more. But yeah. Edge of Tomorrow. Is it the Hoover Dam? No, it's a dam. Eh, yeah, whatever. And I could be wrong. I I, I gave it a quick look over because I was getting my notes and I was like, "Ah, I don't think that's the Hoover Dam. I think it's just a regular dam in Germany. Uh, What about Westworld? Let's briefly go through Westworld. Uh, Shout out Yelly B on, on Instagram reminded me many months ago that the Hoover Dam is actually a major part of season four. And, and oh, by the way, Westworld got removed by uh, HBO, removed it from their library, as well as Raised by Wolves, two of their greatest shows. Like, what's, what's going on over there? What are they doing? So they took him out of their library, I guess. Don't ask. And the Westworld storyline is very confusing. It's very good. It's a good show. And I'm sad they canceled it. It, but it was getting very complex. Like I'd I'd be having to rewatch the season recaps every year. I'd be like, "What is what happened? What are they doing?" You know. 
But in episode one of season four, we find out that uh, no, no, eh, no big plot spoilers here. It's fine. In episode one, we find out that after uh, Rohoboam from the previous season got shut down, the massive AI that was giving us the minority report type future that they want us to have where they predict your behavior. William, a.k.a. the man in black, a.k.a. Kristoff from the Truman Show. He plays the Christ figure on the simulation world, Ed Harris. Anyway, a.k.a. (laughs) Man in Black, he goes to the Hoover Dam because there's a massive data storage there now. It's in the future, right? And he's going to buy all the data stored there because that's what this is always about. It's about stealing your data and selling it to other people. That's what all of these... uh, tech companies do it's what social media is here for later we find out that the door to this realm called the sublime is kept in the data vault at the hoover dam but wait a couple more hang on there attention gamer nerds attention gamer nerds there's a couple video games and i don't play games so not i joke right i'm a side scroller mario kind of gamer okay but apparently in fallout new vegas where they have post-apocalyptic battles over energy output, they fight over the Hoover Dam, which to me is probably a more plausible scenario than Transformer alien technology. If you've noticed the price of energy and instability, that's kind of, and population, I mean, eh, might be a thing. And then lastly, uh, Duke Nukem Forever. The aliens use the energy from the Hoover Dam to create a wormhole. Maybe that's what we'll do someday. We don't know. Right? Now, some other miscellaneous we could bring up. If you take a $50 bill and um, the old one, I guess the new ones don't do this, but the old one, if you folded it, it would show the Hoover Dam. The new one, it shows the Hoover Dam, but it's um, what's interesting is that the old one shows it uh, basically exploding. I mean, I've seen it. I see what they're saying. I mean, you know, a little subjective, but yeah, I mean, it's on there. And uh, the uh, the water is actually flowing on the new one, allegedly, right? Now, Nick said that it had been conjectured for years that this thing would explode. So the question is, did someone design the $50 bill to show us that? If so, why? Um, you know, I don't know. Lots of questions, right? And this gets into conspiracy theories about what you want to believe. Okay. Now, let's... This is where we're going to get... We're going to get a little bit deep into the occult. And then we're going to talk about architecture. And then we're going to wrap it up for part two. For part one, excuse me. And we're coming back with part two next week. All right, so you got to stick with me, though. Let's look at what Nick said in his book. He said the Hoover Dam splits time because it sits in between the two t- two time zones. The first time it produced energy was 9-11-1935, 66 years before 9-11-2001. Okay. Now, why does 66 matter? Well, if you look at the Kabbalistic ideas of the dark side to the Kabbalah tree of life, you find the Klepoth. This is the realm of the fallen gods, the fallen angels. And these fallen angels, their number is 66. Very strange, right? Now, why does 9-11 matter? Because 9-11 plays in the Kabbalah too. Also, I should say. They tell us on the conscious level that, or what would you say, the uh, the mundane level, it's the day everything changed because they have to make it simple for us dummies. But in reality, they are magicians working behind the scenes using occult practices. That's the theory, which I subscribe to on some levels. I don't know if every detail about it is accurate, but it sure is weird. And if you want more, I did... What did I, did I do three or four? No, hell, five episodes on 9-11 back in 2022, I think, or 21. It was in September. I did four, and then I did a fit, a bonus episode where I actually read 
um uh, my pet goat <laughs> yeah i bought the copy of my pet goat the one george bush was reading to the kids and i read it that was a bonus episode another bonus perk let me gatekeep all the info from you for your five dollars <laughs> okay 9-11 why does it matter they tell us on the conscious level it's the day everything changed Everything changed that day. That's what they told us on repeat. We'd have a new normal. And, of course, the only thing that really changed is that we we <laughs> got the Patriot Act, and now they spy on us all the time. That's how we got safer. Okay, you got it, buddy. But symbolically, the two towers came down. Okay, that's the Boaz and Yaquin, the entrance to the mystical place, the left and right pillar on the Kabbalistic Tree of Life. And if you rise up between in the center pillar of consciousness, then you have the single tower, the new one world tower, right? One world order. And that center pillar goes through the dark realm, the Daoth Sephirot, okay? And and look, here's the thing with Kabbalah. It gets real dicey. I am not an expert. This Some of these occult practices... The books are very hard to read. I feel like you almost have to have a a guide sort of teaching you in person some of this stuff. But it gets real dicey, right? So I'm going to say some of this stuff. I could be off a touch here or there. And and I recently I was on Coast to Coast, Coast to Coast AM, not to brag, but I I shouted out Freeman Fly because he's, he's the guy... When you talk about the various red pills, he's the guy who put me on to the occult practices red pill. And I said, this is the one I am, I don't know, I don't want to say devoting my life to. I am fascinated with to the point that I feel like that's the worldview that makes the most sense as to a conspiracy happening. So in this book, The Sefer Yet Zira, it says that ten sephirot of nothingness, ten and not nine, ten and not eleven. But this is not true. There is a hidden realm. There is an eleventh sephirot. And let's back up. Let's back up. In Kabbalah, there's an idea of this tree of life. And the tree of life is God, who they, isn't the God in the clouds, isn't the Abrahamic God, isn't the Holy Trinity, is definitely not Jesus. They think God, this uh, Gnostic belief in the divine realm, the real God, created reality through ten thoughts, each represented as a sphere, a sephirot. Okay? And people who get into this, who practice Kabbalah, they believe that our matter descended... Uh, through consciousness down to this base realm of Malkuth, the earthly realm, the material realm, which again, you take a Gnostic flair and you say, well, the material realm is hell. Okay. The devil runs this. So they try to ascend the tree of life to go from the Sephiroth. One, two, three, four, five, six, you know, whatever, right? Try to ascend by understanding the lessons of, Lessons from each emanation of the thought of God so that man can become God himself. So it's represented by 10 circle or spherical sephirot on a Kabbalistic tree of life. If you Google the image, you'll see it. Now, what's interesting is that, and there's different flavors of Kabbalah, and almost all of them will say, yeah, there's 10 sephirot, but some of them say there's an 11th. It's hidden in the center. It's Daoth. And it's up that center pillar of consciousness, which is what the one world tower represents. Okay, the balancing of the opposing forces. When I say that on the conscious level that I tell you everything changed, on the unconscious level, in the occult realm, they are manifesting a change. All right. Now, Deot, the 11th Sephirah, is the wisdom of God. It's the hidden realm. And it's considered all ten Sephiroth connected into one, in a way. A cheater realm, if you will. 
but they say it's uh, the reflection of Keter. Keter is the topmost, the super consciousness, the mind of God, the closest to the mind of God, uh, I guess. And Deat is a reflection of that. So in terms of fidelity, it seems like it's kind of the most accurate in embodying what it is you're supposed to embody, but it's not quite perfect. Right? So you're already seeing ideas of it being a sort of imperfect realm or a fallen angel. That's my take. I don't know. But the super conscious mind of Keter is, actually, is technically actually the first Sephiroth. That's actually the first one. And then it goes down to Malkuth, which is the tenth. But from the practice of the initiate in the earth material realm, Keter is the tenth Sephiroth. One must try to understand whatever. And Keter means crown because it's above the head, meaning it's act- the mind of God is above the conscious mind of the practitioner. It's very hard to understand the mind of God. So symbolically, they demonstrate it as a crown. And Deat, the hidden realm, is man's understanding of the, non- of the non-understandable. Okay. Uh, in Greek Orthodoxy, I ask my priest often some absurd questions. <laughs> He always says, look, we we can't understand the mind of God, so don't bother. And I mean, I'm paraphrasing. That's not exactly what he says, but a lot of ideas come from this. This, You know, you ask your priest, well, what's the meaning of life? What's the meaning of all this? We, we know so much. God gave us so much in, wisdom in the Bible. And it's like, well, on some realms, you have to just consign over and say, you know, we don't know God's mind. We have no way of understanding it. So anyway, the initiate... They start at the very bottom, Malkuth, the tenth, technically, Sephiroth, but from their perspective, the first. And in Malkuth, they work their way up, and ideally, they make it to the tenth Sephiroth, Keter, the crown, and become like God. But it's the mind of God, you can't quite know it anyway. So sometimes, I guess people who decide to become magicians, and this is where it gets into Freeman Flies, I should, I'd love to get him on the show someday. He infamously doesn't really do other interviews. He'll do one or two as he here and there, but he's very difficult. But to get a hold of, to do this. <laughs> Someday I'll get him on. But you got to skip the ninth, Sephiroth, skip God's wisdom and go to the hidden realm, the 11th, Deoth, which is how Freeman infamously predicted 9-11 being a day of a occult ritual. So there you have it. Oh and, oh, and to bring it back to the Hoover Dam, Nick said something about the 66 years. Well, in Dayot, in the dark side of the Kabbalistic Tree of Life, you have 66 fallen angels, the Klepoth. So there you go. Uh, finally, architecture. Let's talk about architecture real quick. There was this Norwegian... Born naturalized American named Oscar J.W. Hansen, who made the sculptures you can find at Hoover Dam. Norwegian is very interesting. Makes me think of Twin Peaks. Makes me think of it. I'm very obsessed with the show right now. <laughs> but uh, so Oscar Hansen made a bunch of the sculptures, and Gordon. Kopp, sorry, everybody. I'm playing with my. If you're watching the video, I'm playing with my my beautiful locks today. Uh, I got my wrestling hair today. I'm ready to rock and roll. Gordon Kaufman was the architect behind the rest of the Art Deco stuff you see at Hoover Dam. All right, but let's talk about Oscar Hansen because he is Illuminate Confirm. Yes, indeed. I'm going to read you straight from OscarJWHanson.org's website. Oscar was born March 9th, 1892 in the remote fishing village of Oxnes, Norway, to unwed mother Josephine Maximilian jo- Johannesson. Baker Herman Hansen is listed as Oscar's father on his birth certificate, but Oscar reports his father is actually King Oscar II of Norway and Sweden, who was notorious for impregnating women while touring the country. Uh, Nick Cannon. He's basically Nick Cannon. Now, what's interesting, so he's already got this elitist royalty bloodline, he's claiming. And in the 1920s through the 1940s, on this website, it says he developed friendships with famous mystics. So we're already starting to see some illuminate firm ideas here. We're like, wait a minute, wait a minute. 
Then in 1953, uh, after the Hoover Dam, right, after he already did all his work there, the U.S. government (laughs) gave him the world's oldest seeds to grow. He has this this greenhouse, a 350-acre Pantops Mountain greenhouse, and they gave him the world's oldest seeds to grow there. But then later, he would go bankrupt after battling the U.S. government over the Yorktown Monument. I guess he had beef with that. And testified to Congress against Eisenhower's Middle East military policy. So it started to get a little too big for his britches, apparently. He's biting the hand that feeds. And then in 1964, he was arrested for stealing millions of dollars from a covenant of nuns. Now, was he set up? Because he was causing a lot of problems. And there's nothing worse than stealing money from the religious, uh, you know, from the nuns. Maybe. I don't know. But listen to this. I'm going to leave you with this. The website says, and I'm going to read to you right from it here. Oscar's fascinating but never told life story includes archaeological expeditions, world-famous artists, Connections to nine U.S. presidents, alien theories, a broken family, astrophysical discoveries, and a Holy Grail quest. But it offers no explanation on the alien theories or the Grail quest, uh, besides the idea that him making artwork of it out of gems. And they, and then he wrote a book too. And I couldn't track the book down. That took me so long trying to find this book. This book, it, well, the book's called Beyond the Cherubim. And uh, I'll be damned if I can, I try to track down a physical print. I try to track down a PDF. I tried to get on the, the, the shady realms to try to find a copy. I couldn't find it, but it's got to be where he talks about these, these alien theories, which I would think would be fascinating. In fact, I uh, I I put my boy Doctor Anteater on the on the case. He couldn't find it, and he he's always able to find stuff for me. So, uh, yeah, if you if you're able to figure out a way to get what's it called Beyond the Cherubim by Oscar, spelled with a K, Hanson, let me know. Hit me up. All right, that's it for Hoover Dam Part One. Okay, Hoover Dam Part Two. We're coming back next week. We're gonna get into the statues, and this is where it gets really interesting. A lot of Promethean intellect worship luciferian ideas are going to fall from these statues because like i said this stuff's going to be here for hundreds thousands of years we don't know and it could be a message to the alien gods but either way there's a cult doctrine baked into the hoover dam and in part two we're going to get into it and we're going to reveal the truth so there you go i hope you enjoyed part one the uh the way to get the show ad free you know where to go. Patreon.com slash Illuminati Watcher. That's the most popular option. The easiest option is Apple Podcast Premium. You just click the button you're in. You can compare all the different ways you can do it at IlluminatiWatcher.com. Hit the VIP tab. It'll tell you all about the other options, right? But by far the most popular is Patreon. Uh, you can get on there and comment, message me and stuff. And that's the best way to get a hold of me. And uh, yeah, thank you for your support, everybody. And until next time. Stay woke.